Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. And you know, it's astonishing just how well the Canadian National Anthem fits the intro of my World of Warships videos. It's almost as if they were made for each other. What's this Canada nonsense, Jingles? Well, today we're going to be taking a look at the first Royal Canadian Navy ship to be introduced to World of Warships. This is His Majesty's Canadian ship, Hyder. It's a Tier 7 Tribal Class Destroyer. The Tribals were originally intended to be light fleet cruisers, but as the design evolved over time, they eventually changed into very fast, very powerful destroyers, with the emphasis on guns rather than torpedoes. Only a handful of the Royal Navy's Tribals survived World War II, and they were all scrapped almost as soon as hostilities had ceased. Not because there was anything specifically wrong with the design, they were a very good design, but the Royal Navy's tribals were all basically buggered from being overused <laughs> and worked to death during World War II. The Commonwealth tribals, however, did survive and went on to serve both Canada and Australia well into the Cold War. Only one tribal survives to this day. His Majesty's, or now Her Majesty's, Canadian ship, Hyda, which is a museum ship in Ontario in Canada. The Hyder is regarded with immense pride by the people of Canada, and justifiably so. She's earned a reputation as, and I quote, the fightingest ship. <laughs> is that a word? It is now. The fightingest ship in the Royal Canadian Navy. No other ship in Canadian service has ever sunk more enemy ships or blown more stuff up than the Hyder. Hyda was launched on the 25th of August 1942 at the Vickers Armstrong Limited shipyards in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England, my hometown. She was commissioned into the Royal Canadian Navy after completing the sea trials on the 30th of August 1943 and pretty much immediately went to work. On the 16th of October 1943 she was one of nine destroyers providing the covering force in combination with two cruisers HMS London and USS Augusta for a fleet of Lend-Lease warships which were being escorted to Russia. On the 18th of November she was deployed with the destroyers HMS Impulsive, Onslaught, Onslow, Orwell, Obdurate, the Canadian destroyers Huron and Iraqi as ocean escorts for convoy Juliet Whiskey 54 Alpha during passage to the Kola Inlet. On the 26th of the same month she joined the return convoy with the same ships as close escort for passage back to the UK. And then the following month, on the 22nd of December, Hyder joined the close escort screen for yet another Russian-bound convoy, JW-55. You may have heard of JW-55. This was the convoy that was being hunted by the Scharnhorst. Luckily, or perhaps unluckily, depending on your perspective, Hyder didn't see any direct combat against the Scharnhorst. She stayed with the convoy and continue to escort it safely to Russia. It would not be too long, however, before the Hyder got the opportunity to fire her guns in anger. Beginning in February 1944, she began deploying for exercises working up in preparation for Operation Neptune, which was the naval component of the D-Day landings. On the 25th of April 1944, she was deployed with HMS Black Prince, HMS Ashanti, HMCS Athabascan and Huron as Force 26 for an operation to intercept coastal traffic in the Bay of Biscay. The very next day, on the 26th of April 1944, three German Elbing-class destroyers were detected with radar. These were the T-24, the T-27 and the T-29, who were on passage for mine laying duties and covering German coastal convoys. Force 26 and Hyder immediately opened fire with their main battery guns, and the German destroyers responded initially with a series of torpedo strikes, none of which hit their targets. T-29 was sunk by gunfire with a loss of 135 of her crew. The T-24 and the T-27 managed to escape. This was the first enemy destroyer that had ever been sunk by a Royal Canadian Navy ship. It would not be the last. On the 29th of April 1944, Hyder and HMCS Athabascan were escorting a group of mine layers when they received a warning that German destroyers were in the vicinity. Ordered to intercept, they soon obtained radar contact it was our old friends, the T-24 and the T-27, once again. Hyder and Athabascan immediately opened fire with their main battery guns. The two German destroyers immediately launched torpedoes, started to make smoke, and headed for the coast. Two of the torpedoes struck HMCS Athabascan, 
and the ship sank after a huge explosion. Hyder, however, continued to give chase. Unfortunately, she was just one destroyer chasing two destroyers. She couldn't chase them both. So after scoring a couple of hits on the T-24 and forcing her to run for cover, she sunk her teeth right into the T-27 and after scoring further hits and setting her on fire, succeeded in running the T-27 aground just off the coast of Brittany. Only stopping to capture 85 German prisoners of war, Heider then returned to the location of the Athabascan and began to search for survivors, rescuing 45 of the Athabascan's crew. Sadly, 127 were lost, although miraculously six of the Athabascan's crew managed to get away in a motorboat and managed to return to the UK under their own steam. On the 6th of June 1944, D-Day, Force 26 was reconstituted and ordered to patrol a screen off the coast of Brittany to protect invasion traffic from German surface raiders. Three days later, on the 9th of June, a suspicious radar contact was detected, and upon closing to investigate, Hyder and Force 26 discovered four German destroyers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, one of them was the Elbing-class destroyer, the T-24, once again, who apparently hadn't learned her lesson the first two times. Once again, she wasn't alone. She was accompanied by the two Narvik-class destroyers, the Z-32 and Z-24, and the ZH-1, which was the next Dutch destroyer, the Tjerk Hedders, which was captured after the fall of Holland in May 1940. Enemy ships, realising they'd been detected, altered course and fired torpedoes, all of which were avoided. Hyder engaged with HMS Tata, HMS Ashanti and HMCS Huron with their main and secondary armaments at close range. During the action, Z-32 was seriously damaged and eventually run ashore. ZH-1 was sunk by gunfire and two torpedoes from Ashanti. Z-24 and the T-24, although badly damaged, were able to escape. So, just in case you haven't been keeping count, that's Hyder versus T-24. So far it's 3-0 to Hyder. On the 24th of June, she took passage with HMS Eskimo to provide cover for anti-submarine operations by ships of the 1st Escort Group and Coastal Command aircraft in the area south of Land's End. Upon receiving a report that a surfaced submarine had been spotted by aircraft, she rushed to the position indicated and carried out depth charges on the U-971. After two hours of battering, the German submarine was forced to the surface and engaged with both main and close-range weapons. Hit scored on the U-971's conning tower started a fire which forced the crew to abandon boat. 53 survivors were rescued and returned to Falmouth as prisoners of war. On the 6th of August 1944, Hyder was intercepting an evacuation convoy with several escorts near the Ile de Yeux. And during the engagement by ships of Force 26, the explosion of a shell being loaded into one of her gun turrets caused 10 casualties, two of which were fatal. Hyder continued to fight, however, and during the engagement, the minesweepers M2286 and M486, patrol boat V414, and a motor launch were all sunk. The two members of Hyder's crew who were lost in the accident in the gun turret were buried two days later in Devonport on the 9th of August. Hyder had enjoyed a pretty spectacular war in a relatively short period of time. She was only commissioned in 1943, but in all that time she'd never been home. And so on the 29th of September 1944, it was a bit of a special day for the ship and the crew because this was when they returned to Halifax in Nova Scotia and it was the first time the ship had seen her homeland. She didn't get too long to enjoy it however because after a couple of months of refit it was straight back to Plymouth in early 1945 and straight back into escort and patrol duties. And while she would continue to provide very valuable service doing these duties, she was not going to enjoy the opportunity of firing her guns in anger again at least for the remainder of World War II. And given the ship's performance thus far, that was probably very good news for the German Navy. After the end of hostilities in Europe, Hyder and her two sister ships, the tribal-class destroyers HMCS Huron and Iroquois, took passage from Greenock for Halifax, where they arrived on the 10th of June 1945 to a resounding and well-deserved reception. In August 1945, after victory was declared over Japan and World War II officially ended, Hyder was nominated for reduction to reserve status. This would not last long, however. The ship was recommissioned for service in 1947, and in 1949 she rescued the 18 crew of an American B-29 superfortress that had crashed in the Atlantic, as a result of which the ship's company were presented with this certificate. Whereas it has been brought to the attention of the nominating committee 
that the officers and crew of destroyer Hyder have been outstanding in their field for many years and rescued the shipwrecked crew of a B-29 plane whose co-pilot was a Texan, and whereas they would likely bring further honours to the state of Texas, they are hereby made honorary Texans. This entitles them to wear cowboy boots, a ten-gallon hat, and to generally conduct themselves as Texans. No bronc riding test is necessary at this time in order to conserve horsepower. You know a ship is badass when Texas tries to claim it. And Hyder would go on to enter a very exclusive club after the outbreak of hostilities in Korea. On the 29th of January 1953, while escorting aircraft carriers and performing coastal bombardments, Hyder finally entered the Train Busters Club by shooting up and destroying the locomotive of North Korean supply train before it could duck into the safety of a railway tunnel along the North Korean coast. Hyder wasn't content with just one train kill, however. On the 26th of May the same year, she got another one. She remained in the Far East after the end of hostilities in Korea, and apart from refit periods between 1954 and 1962, the ship was operationally deployed by the Royal Canadian Navy, including service in support of NATO. By 1962, it became pretty evident that the ship was no longer really suitable for active duty, and she was paid off on the 11th of October 1963. The final disposal wasn't determined until 1964, when she was purchased for use as a museum ship and taken to Toronto. On the 30th of August 2003, after a $5 million refit, Hyder arrived at her new home on the Hamilton waterfront. After being greeted by an 11-gun salute fired by the Royal Canadian Sea Cadet Corps' 12-pounder naval field gun, the old girl took up her duties as a National Historic Site of Canada, and in February 2018 she was designated the ceremonial flagship of the Royal Canadian Navy. Kind of brings a lump to your throat, really, doesn't it? Well, anyway, she's here. Canada, at last. You've got your ship. And given this ship's history and significance, it was always going to be this ship. But is she any good in World of Warships? And if the answer to that question is no, there are almost certainly going to be some riots amongst the beavers and moose north of the border. Although they'll almost certainly apologise and offer to pay for the damage afterwards. Luckily, however, you don't have to worry about any wildlife running riot, because the answer to that question is not no under certain circumstances. That's not much of an answer, Jingles. You better start making sense and fast. Okay, fair enough. You see, the thing with Hyder is that while she is a very, very good ship under certain circumstances, you really kind of have to be good to get the most out of her. You see, the Hyder is probably the most aggressive destroyer in World of Warships, which really shouldn't be surprising given the ship's history. And when I say aggressive, I mean, there is probably no better ship in World of Warships for hunting down and killing enemy destroyers. And when I say that, I realise that we have ships like the Atlanta, the Minotaur, the Worcester and the Flint in the game, and I still say there is no better ship than the Hyder for hunting down and killing enemy destroyers. The problem is that in order to be any good at that, you have to be pretty aggressive, which again is probably quite appropriate given this ship's history. But it's a tier 7 destroyer, and you start running into radar in tier 7 destroyers. So in order to get the most out of this ship, you kind of have to enjoy a pretty high risk playstyle. And that's why I say this ship is not going to be for everybody. People that play the ship cautiously, that like to hang back and maybe not push the caps too aggressively, they're probably not going to have a lot of fun in this ship. Well they might, but they're not going to be too effective. In order to get the most out of the Hyder, you really have to go for it. And that's very dangerous. Luckily, we have our very own mostly tame Canadian, Little White Mouse, to show us how it's supposed to be done. And we really do have to give special thanks to Little White Mouse for the input and feedback that she provided to Wargaming all throughout the testing process on this ship. If anybody was going to make sure Wargaming got this ship right, it was going to be Little White Mouse. So if you don't like the Hyder, blame her, okay? <laughs> Not me. I had nothing to do with it. Right, let's get started. So, what is it about the Hyder that makes it such an aggressive ship? Well, it's down to a number of factors. Let's take a look at the guns first. The Hyder has six 120mm guns in three turrets. Two forward, one aft. Now, you might be looking at the ship and think, well, hang on a minute. I can see two turrets at the rear. 
Well, the second rearmost turret isn't actually one of the main gun batteries. That's a secondary gun battery. Yes, this is a destroyer with secondary guns. That's a pair of 100mm guns, which also form part of the Hyder's anti-air battery. Now, the main battery 120mm guns, all six of them, are a bit of a mixed bag. The armour-piercing ammunition on them is absolutely terrible. The only time you should be firing armour-piercing from these 120mm guns is when you're at point-blank suicidal ranges firing at the broadside of lightly armoured targets that have citadels, so not destroyers, where you're guaranteed to score citadel hits. In all other circumstances, you need to be firing high explosive. And that's good, because the high explosive shells on this ship are fantastic. Each of the Hyder's 120mm high explosive shells can hit for a maximum of 1,900 damage. And she fires six of them. And they have a five second reload. Which means the Hyder has the highest damage per minute of any of the tier 7 destroyers. Now it has to be admitted that these guns are kind of difficult to use. The firing arcs on all three of the turrets are problematic. But that's where the Hyder's other little perks come into play. With a 10-point captain and the concealment expert skill, this ship has a surface detection range of 5.7 kilometers. It's the sneakiest tier 7 destroyer by a safe margin. And that's not all. Hyder also has the most health of any of the tier 7 destroyers. In fact, she has more health than the Shemikaze, which is a tier 10 destroyer. If you take the survival expert skill, Hyder has over 18,000 hit points. Hard-hitting high-explosive shells, rapid-firing hard-hitting high-explosive shells, the best surface detection rating of any Tier 7 destroyer by far, and more health than an extremely angry moose, means that this ship can comfortably out-trade any Tier 7 destroyer. Heck, even some of the Tier 8 and 9 destroyers. Because if you play this ship properly, you're always going to get the first or even first and second salvos off, which are going to do an arse ton of damage, and you have the health to absorb the return fire. But you don't always have to absorb the return fire if you're in the hider, and you're playing it properly. Because this ship has a very interesting smoke screen. It's a creeping smoke screen, very similar to the one on the Perth and the Huang Hei. It keeps pace with the ship, and lasts for a minute and a half. However, you can't be going any faster than 12 and a half knots. Otherwise, you will leave the cover of the smoke screen, and this will happen. Yeah, Mouse kind of miscalculated her throttle here. <laughs> she managed to get the first blood award, but I think there were seven or eight ships targeting her there. And... yeah. <laughs> you see... This is what I mean when I say the Hyder is a very aggressive ship, or should be played very aggressively in order to make the most of its strengths. But it's a very high-risk playstyle, and it's probably not for everybody. Without the survivability expert skill, Mouse would have been dead, and this would have been a very, very short replay. It's definitely a highly recommended skill on the Hyder, because you have to get this ship up close. The guns, while they are good if you're firing high explosive, the shells are so lightweight that if the target's more than 9 kilometers away, it takes longer for the shells to get to the target than even the infamous American destroyer 127mm shells. The torpedoes, again, are a bit of a mixed bag. The ship only has one torpedo launcher, but each torpedo hits very, very hard indeed. In fact, they're easily capable of one-shotting most of the destroyers that you're going to come across. <laughs> There's kill number two. And because these are... Well, I don't want to get into trouble with Canada and say these are British torpedoes, but, well, the Tribals are a British design. And like the British light cruisers, Hyder also enjoys the ability to fire off the torpedoes either four at a time or one at a time. So if your aim is good, and you ripple fire the torpedoes one after the other. If one of them hits, all four are going to hit. And they do a lot of damage. 16,767 damage per hit, with a very high chance of causing a flood. 
The range is mediocre, eight kilometers, but again, you're in the hider. Most of the targets that you're going to be fighting are at the very most going to be nine kilometers away. And with a 5.7 kilometer surface detection range, you've still got the ability to stealth fire them. They have a speed of 62 knots. So that's pretty quick. And they are an improvement on Japanese torpedoes, because they have 200 meters less detectability, which gives you far less reaction time when the torpedoes are spotted. And then we come to Hyder's final gimmick, and that's her hydroacoustic search consumable. Yes, this is a destroyer with sonar. Now at first glance it looks like this sonar isn't much good. It has a very, very short range. It will only detect an enemy ship at a range of 2.13 kilometers. Now if that enemy ship is a destroyer, that's only 1.12 kilometers beyond the standard auto detection range. This is not like a German destroyer with hydroacoustic search with a long range, comparatively, that can be used to aggressively push into enemy smoke screens, hiding destroyers, locate them well outside of auto detection range, and enable a German destroyer to attack an enemy destroyer inside a smoke screen. The Hyder's hydroacoustic search does not work like that. What it does is render you, to all intents and purposes, practically immune to being torpedoed. As long as this hydroacoustic search is running, if you get torpedoed, it's basically your own fault, because you weren't paying attention. And it lasts a long time, three minutes. If you've got the hydroacoustic search mod 1, and with the introduction of the arsenal into World of Warships, you can buy this mod with coal, so there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get it, the sonar on this ship can last three minutes and 46 seconds. So what you have here with the Hyder is a ship that can outspot anything that could be considered a threat, and can outshoot anything that outspots her. And there's not an awful lot that outspots her. She's got a Hydro that renders her to all intents and purposes immune to torpedo attack, providing you're paying attention. She has an incredibly flexible smokescreen that you can take with you, <laughs> which is exactly what Mouse is doing here. You see, this isn't like the smoke screens used by other destroyers that effectively, once you've deployed it, anchor you to one spot. Mouse took out a target, realized she was too far away to effectively fire at the other targets that she could see, throttled up the engine, got closer, took the smoke screen with her, <laughs> and, and now she's shooting at other enemy ships. Of course the smoke screen is about to expire, and so now she stops shooting. 5.7 kilometer service detection range with the concealment expert skill. It's only a tier 7 destroyer, so you can't fit the concealment mod. But the extremely low base surface detection range of the ship, it's as if the ship comes with the concealment mod built in, which is only enhanced with a 10 point captain and the concealment expert skill. So there's a sort of theme emerging here with the Hyder. You have to get close. That's a dangerous game, however, as Mouse has clearly demonstrated when she accidentally throttled up a little bit too much in her initial smokescreen, exceeded a speed of 12.5 knots, got spotted, and within seconds was being targeted by nine enemy ships. At the kind of ranges where the Hyder is effective, less than nine kilometers, a destroyer does not last very long at all if it gets spotted. Although the Hyder has more chances of staying alive under those circumstances than most other destroyers in this or even higher tiers, thanks to the large health pool. And if the worst comes to the worst, while the Hyder isn't particularly quick, fire up that engine boost and she will go faster than 40 knots. So if the shit hits the fan, you can get out of dodge pretty quickly, and you've got the health to take a few hits along the way. Now. This all sounds really good, and at the risk of being a bit of a negative Nancy, I sh oh hold on a second, that York's getting dangerously close and he does have hydroacoustic search. Perhaps he's getting ready to launch torpedoes, let's finish him off just in case, there's kill number four. Good stuff. And while she's working over the Omaha here, oh and scoring three torpedo hits on the Colorado. <laughs> From the four that she fired earlier. And that's a lot of damage with these torpedoes. Yeah, there he is. He doesn't look particularly happy. 
but neither would you if you're just taking 30,000 damage and three floods. But he has used his damage control and she's attempting to set him on fire, but with a base 5% fire chance, you don't set a huge amount of fires in the hider. And while the Colorado is creeping up on her, she's creeping away from him. Thanks to that creeping smoke screen, it lasts for a minute and a half, although each puff of smoke only lasts for 10 seconds. But providing you're not going any faster than 12.5 knots or quarter throttle, the smoke screen keeps pace with you. And if you need to get out of dodge quickly, oh and look there's the confederate award, you can just stop firing, providing you're more than 5.7 kilometers away, throttle up, retire to a safe distance, and take the smoke screen with you. You can go a little bit faster than 12 and a half knots, as Mouse just tried to do there. You, you can get away with it, you can kind of flutter the throttle up to half speed for very short bursts, but you run the risk of being detected. And she did momentarily get detected there, but it didn't look like anybody was paying too much attention, so she got away with it. But it's a very, very dangerous game. And that's kind of the hider, in a nutshell. Playing this ship to its strengths, getting in close, the hider's comfort zone would be considered suicide for any other destroyer. And that's why I was saying I don't want to be a bit of a negative Nancy here, but I don't want everybody to think I'm just... Oh, crap. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> oh, no, there's an enemy destroyer on her flank. She's gone undetected again, but there are going to be shots in the air. There they are. <laughs> How close was that? 19 hit points. <laughs> you see, this is what I'm talking about. This is the Hydra in a nutshell. It can be incredibly rewarding to play. But in order to do that, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to get in close. And if you want to survive, you have to be good. The ship gives you the tools to make it work. You've got incredibly hard-hitting, high-explosive shells. And at the kind of ranges where you should be using these guns, even ships like the Sims, the Bliskadicha, and the Beehole Mayhan are going to melt in the face of your firepower. Because you're always going to get the first if not the first two salvos off, and your shells hit a lot harder than theirs do. Plus, your torpedoes, while you only have one torpedo launcher, you're going to be firing those torpedoes at extremely short range, and the Hyder packs almost as much punch with her four torpedoes as the Sims does with its eight. Your short range but extremely long duration hydroacoustic search means that as long as you're paying attention, you should never get torpedoed by anything that you're fighting. And you've got that smoke screen, which allows you to get the hell out of here if you don't like the odds, and take the smoke screen with you once you've retired to a suitable range. All of this is great stuff, but none of it is easy to use. In order to employ the hider to its best potential, you need good situational awareness, good map awareness, you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of the targets that you're going to be facing, does the enemy ship have radar? Does the enemy ship have hydroacoustic search? What's the range of its radar? What's the duration of its radar? What's the range of its hydroacoustic search? Does it have torpedoes? What are the range of the torpedoes? All of this sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, and that's why the Hyde is a difficult ship to play well, if you're going to play it to its strengths, because that's a lot of information to have at your disposal. And not everybody playing World of Warships has that kind of information at their disposal. And not everybody playing World of Warships has a good sense of situation or map awareness. And so a lot of people are going to get their hands on the Hyder and just get murdered in it. <laughs> or they're not going to play it aggressively, which is a shame. Because, oh, hold on a second. She's going for the cheeky shots here. She no longer has a smoke screen. So, this is going to be very risky. Well, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about, actually. Watch. First, she's lining up the torpedoes. But, he's at the extreme limit of the torpedo range, and now you can see by the torpedo track indicator that he's starting to turn away. So the torpedoes are never going to reach him. She's going to have to use the guns. 
The danger here, of course, is that she no longer has a smokescreen available, so the second she fires, she gets spotted, but she's watching the New York's rear gun turrets as he swings the ship around, and there's the fire, and she is targeted, and the second the New York is able to bring the rear gun turrets to bear, she's already gunned the engines, and she's safely in cover behind the island. Is she going to get the kill on the New York? The fire is burning. And no. <laughs> well, she did try. But sadly, the Kraken was denied just now. But this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about with the Hyder. These are the kind of skills that you really kind of need in order to make the ship work. And let's face it these kind of skills are not exactly common currency in World of Warships. So the Hider is most definitely not for everybody. You do kind of need to be good to make it work effectively. Sure, you can hang back at long range, but the high explosive shells, though they hit hard, stay in the air forever, which makes hitting targets at ranges in excess of 9 kilometers problematic at best. All of the tools that you have in the Hider are for knife fights, they're for close range combat. And that's an extremely dangerous place to be in a destroyer. And not everybody can make it work. So, again, I don't want to be too much of a negative Nancy, but I don't want people to think that I'm talking this ship up as an exceptionally good ship that everybody is going to enjoy and do well in. Because not everybody is going to enjoy this ship, and not everybody is going to do well in it. Mouse still has the chance to get a Kraken. The only problem is it's the enemy destroyer. Actually, that's not a problem. Hunting destroyers is what the Hyder's for. Okay, she only has 19 hit points. But she can probably get the first two salvos off. And it shouldn't take more than two salvos to kill that Monaghan. How much health did he have? Around about 2,000, 3,000? Yeah, two salvos. That should do it. 5.7 kilometer surface detection range. She's definitely going to get the first shot off, possibly the second shot too. She can't afford to take a single hit in return, of course, and she doesn't have the smoke screen anymore. But if she can get enough shots on target quickly enough, there's no reason why she can't kill that guy, even with 19 hit points. There is less than 2,000 health. If she can get the first two salvos off before he returns fire, he's dead and she wins with a Kraken Unleashed. There's one, there's two, he's dead. That's it. Good night. Boom, headshot. It was over before he could even react. It wasn't even close. Oh, go on then, have a Kraken. You earned it. Oh, Canada, you finally made it into World of Warships, even if your flag didn't. Yeah, that's a bit of an issue. I mean, well, is it, isn't it? Depends who you ask. Um, if you're British, or a member of the British Commonwealth, or Canadian, it's probably quite annoying to not see the Canadian ensign on the back of Canada's first ship, something that I suspect our Australian viewers, g'day Bruce, uh, are probably intimately familiar with since the introduction of HMAS Perth, which also features this kind of made-up Commonwealth flag rather than the white ensign or the Royal Australian Navy flag. And it can't be too much effort for Wargaming to give us the ships with the flags that they actually fought under. I mean, it's just a little thing, but it's a flag. I mean, people get quite excited about this sort of thing. And I'm sure that both the Australians with HMAS Perth and the Canadians with HMCS Hyder would very much appreciate it. I know I certainly would. And I'm also, I have to confess, very appreciative of a little white mouse. Not just for the replay that she submitted for this video review, not just for the help feedback, assistance and guidance that she provided to Wargaming in order to ensure that the Hyder came out right, and not only for her exemplary Hyder review on the North American forums, which I have to admit I shamelessly ripped off <laughs> in order to make this video, uh, link down below in the video description, credit where credit's due, but also just for her being an all-round good egg and snappy dresser and working tirelessly behind the scenes, not just as a community contributor for World of Warships, but also crunching data and mining information for the rest of us community contributors on the World of Warships Discord. So, Little White Mouse, we salute you. And I'd also, since we're here, and we seem to be thanking everybody, I'd like to give a personal thank you for the men of the Royal Canadian Navy during World War II. 
who, along with the sailors of the Royal Australian and Royal New Zealand Navy, stepped up when the mother country needed them, and answered the call in our hour of need, and without whose contribution, the Battle of the Atlantic would almost certainly have ended very, very differently. So, to all of you, and, well, Canada in particular, because today's all about Canada, thank you very much. Your service was not unappreciated. Oh, go on, South Africa too. I mean, at the outbreak of World War II, the South African Navy only consisted of three officers and three ratings. <laughs> and while they didn't have any ships, hundreds did volunteer to serve on board Royal Navy warships. So, to all of the nations of the dominions of the British Empire, we owe you one. And we probably don't say it enough. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. That's the Hyder review. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're going to enjoy the ship, but remember, it's a good ship, but it's only as good as you. So you have been warned. And that's pretty much it for today. Now it's about quarter past five in the morning, and I need to get this video rendered and uploaded to YouTube so I can go to bed. And hopefully this video isn't going to get claimed by somebody, because I've used the Canadian National Anthem. Yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> Seriously, you don't want to know. Anyway, that's it. Video's done. I'm going to bed. As always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.